Hello! In this video, we're going to look at two specialised um, MRI techniques for studying the function and connectivity of the brain. Uh, and we're going to use a fantastic tool called the Brain Browser, which has been provided by McGill University over in Canada. The first technique we're going to consider is functional MRI, and the second technique we're going to look at is diffusion imaging. So let's start off with functional MRI. Here we've got um, just a very simple 3D representation of the human brain here. And in a minute I'm going to overlay some functional MRI data onto that. But first of all, let's just talk very briefly about how functional MRI works. Essentially what functional MRI does is measures the oxygen um, content of the blood being delivered to a particular region of the brain. And the signal that's being measured is known as the BOLD signal, the BO standing for blood oxygenation. The idea being that if we can um, follow oxygen in the brain, we can infer that areas of the brain taking up more oxygen will be more active. And so the inference is that um, if oxygen is being used faster in a region of the brain, it's more metabolically active, meaning that the neural activity is increased. And so consequently, we can put subjects into fMRI scanners and look at how their brain activity changes when they're doing particular tasks. Now, the f what I'm going to do, just to show you an example of the kind of thing that this technique can show us, is we're going to look at what's known as correlational data, um, whereby if you gather enough data from fMRI experiments, you can see how the activity in different regions of the brain correlates with activity in other regions of the brain. And the inference being that if two regions of the brain are active simultaneously or near simultaneously, then they are likely to be functionally connected. Now I'm showing you the left hemisphere of the brain here, and that is for actually a very specific region reason. Because what I want to do is I want to make our um, center, if you like, Broca's area in the left frontal lobe. So what I'm just going to do first is just make my area of interest a little bit smaller. And I'm going to highlight Broca's area. Effectively, imagine that I'm switching on Broca's area. And what we're going to see is we're going to see Broca's area light up just here. And then we're going to see a number of other areas of the brain light up simultaneously. So if I switch on Broca's area just at this point, we see something rather interesting. Okay, For your reference, um, high levels of the highest levels of activity are red, and the lowest levels of activity are um, purple or white. Um, slightly less active regions are more of a yellowy or green colour. So we, act, we think of this, ex, this is an experiment where we've activated Broca's area and we're looking which regions are connected. And interestingly, we see a number of important regions being connected to Broca's area. We can see Wernicke's area here um, lights up in yellow and green, so relatively strongly. And we can also see the superior temporal lobe lights up, that being the site of the primary auditory cortex. So what we have highlighted here by, if you like, stimulating Broca's area is we've highlighted the language network present within the left hemisphere. Okay. So just to give an example, let's say that we hear, um, we hear someone speaking. This activates the superior temporal lobe, the primary auditory cortex. Information flows from the auditory cortex to Wernicke's area, where essentially it is um, interpreted, understood, and then information then passes from um, Wernicke's area to through to Broca's area where a response could be produced or that word could be repeated. So you can see the power of this fMRI approach whereby we can look at correlations in the level of activity between different regions. Now furthermore we can also see some additional very interesting features. We can see that when we stimulated Broca's area, we also see stimulation in this here, this region here. Now, this is the lateralmost portion of the precentral gyrus. Just to give you your landmarks, 
Here is the central sulcus. This is the pre-central gyrus, that being con the, the site of the primary motor cortex. And this is the post-central gyrus, that being the site of the primary sensory cortex. And we can see that when we stimulate Broca's area, we have activity in the pre-central gyrus relating to the region of the motor cortex that supplies the muscles of the face and neck. These muscles being very important in the production of language. Furthermore, connected to this network um, are the occipital poles, okay, the site of the primary visual cortex. And this reminds us that language can enter this language network not just through the ears, but also from the visual system. So information coming from the visual system can um, be directed to Wernicke's area where it can be understood um, as, as language, where written language can be understood. Um, and if you were reading out um, a passage from a book, for example, um, that information would be going from the occipital lobes, then to Wernicke's area, then to Broca's area, and then to the um, facial region of the primary motor cortex. So that's just a very simple um, depiction of, of a simple kind of functional MRI experiment that can be performed. So that's fMRI. Let's now consider the second specialised MRI technique that I wanted to discuss, and that is diffusion imaging. Okay, diffusion imaging. Now, fMRI um, focuses upon the function of the grey matter in the brain. This is looking at the activity of synapses um, and, and, and essentially looking at the, the, the computation occurring within the cortex or other regions of grey matter. Diffusion imaging is focusing on white matter pathways and it is looking at anatomical connectivity between different brain regions. And the way that diffusion imaging works, once again using an MRI scanner, um, is it looks at the diffusion of water along axonal pathways. So if you imagine, um, if, if this pen um, is an, was an axon, um, water would preferentially diffuse along the length of the axon as opposed to in the transverse direction, because of course we've got the presence of the axonal membrane and the associated glial cells. So water tends to preferentially uh, diffuse longitudinally along axons through white matter. And the MRI scanner can detect that. And we can use specialised software to reconstruct white matter tracts based upon the movement um, of water. And that's what we're looking at here. Here, what we've got, these coloured lines are um, small groups of axons whose movement of water has been measured in the scanner. And specifically what we're looking at is the motor pathways. So here we are looking at the pathways of upper motor neurons passing from the motor cortex down through the internal capsule and then into the spinal cord. And you can even see approximately, um, if I just zoom in a bit, approximately at this point here they are crossing over resulting in the left hemisphere controlling the right side of the body and vice versa. So one caveat to this is that this is only a very small sample of the axons. Um, a full data set would be overwhelming and, and it would for all intents and purposes look like a solid brain. So this has been thinned down considerably. Um, but diffusion imaging allows us to follow axons through the nervous system. You can superimpose um, anatomical structures onto um, a diffusion imaging data set. So the multicolored blobs here are in fact the two thalami in the left and right hemispheres. And the pale blue blobs are the lentiform nuclei which are part of the basal ganglia. And beautifully you can see how those axons pass through the gap between the thalamus and the lentiform nuclei which is known as the internal capsule. You can follow axons elsewhere as well. We said these are primarily the motor pathways, but we can also see that some are going posteriorly here, and they're actually going to the cerebellum. And we know that the cerebellum has dense connections with the, with the uh, cerebral cortex through these pathways that we can look at. Furthermore, we've got one or two sparse connections within the corpus callosum, but this is only a tiny fraction of 1% 
of the hundreds of millions of axons present within that pathway. So that was just an extremely brief introduction to the two specialized techniques um, using MRI imaging, uh, that being functional MRI and diffusion imaging. So thank you very much for listening.